30 seconds to yeah, air. Yeah, what do you think about flowers? The these are for the guests. Uh, hey, I'm gonna need some more books for these mics. Anyone have the promo for the show notes? Is this, wait, where's the Fiji water? Is this, this isn't, is this tap water? 15 seconds. Can somebody get the cat? I can't drink tap water. Grab the cat. Can, can, can someone tell Joe's mom to stop vacuuming? Bottle. It's not hard to find. Has anybody this seen feet. my hair gel? Tesian water. Natural. Quiet on the set. Live in three, two. Live from Joe's mom's basement. It's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today you're never going to believe what we have in store for you. We're talking about FI, and you know what FI means, right? I mean, it, everybody knows it's free ice cream. What? Financial independence. <laughs> right. Really? My bad. Uh, Well, with a nearly as exciting topic, we welcome the co-author of the book, Choose Financial Independence, Chris Mamula. Plus, in our headline segment, the troubling reasons one recent study shows women don't buy enough life insurance. And don't you worry, I'll make sure the guys save time for my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who always choose yes to high fives. It's Joe and O J J J J G. How can you say no when somebody wants to high five you? You can't. I prefer high tens, high twenties, where you where you stick your feet in the air too. Try that. Welcome to the uh, flexibility podcast. I am Joe Salci. I have Joe Money on Twitter. And it's Monday, OG, and we get to open up everybody's week with Chris Mamula this week. How about that? Sounds like you need to open up your vocal cords with a little hot tea. I think I do. Not only that, in my sleep the other night, something bit the hell out of my chest. Like, look at this. Like The hell? I know, like 10 uh, mosquito bites or, or whatever, like all right next to each other. That looks like a reaction to arsenic. Is there any chance that uh, <laughs> you and Cheryl are on the outs? Cheryl decided we, we've got a lot to One do. One little drop at a time. We've got a lot to do today, but I will tell you this. When we were on our vacation, did I tell you went to the Canadian Rockies? When we, when we were at this really old lodge built in, I think, I think uh, 1909 or 1905. The place is called Deer Lodge right off Lake Louise. Beautiful place, but our room, number one, smelled really funny. <laughs> and and you just chalk that up to the fact that this is a super, super old lodge you're staying at. And then the second thing is, is that just the floors creak. I mean, everything was really old. Well, in the middle of the night, I can't sleep and I'm laying there wide awake when all of a sudden in the gloomy darkness, I see Cheryl's hand come up over my face. And she's starting to squeeze my nose, which, by the way, she does whenever I'm snoring. But I thought, I don't know what I thought. I just turned. I'm like, what What the hell are you doing? What are you doing? She goes, I'm trying to stop you from snoring. And I said, I'm not snoring. I'm laying here wide awake. She goes, no, you are snoring. I'm like, I'm serious. I have been laying here wide awake. And she's like, well, whatever. And then we both get really quiet and we realize you can hear the dude through the wall in the next room snoring as if he's laying right there next to us. She's like, hold still while I put this pillow on your face. The the whole rest of the, the whole rest of the trip. We, I kept joking about you slept in a different room. (laughs) I'm like, uh, I think we need two rooms for this. We had one reservation, but I'm going to need another one here at the luxurious Hampton Inn. Yes. Just in case. Well, we got a guy who retired at 41 on the show. Let's get to work, man. We got some good stuff today. (laughs) You missed that boat. So did I. (laughs) Actually, you did retire at 41. I I sold my business at 40. We'd say I retired. I became a full-time. Well, then you started doing this. Full-time podcaster. I started living the dream at 40. That's right. So take that, Chris Mamula. We're good. We're talking to him. We got some fantastic stuff. You know, today's show, by the way, is brought to you by Grammarly. Thanks to Grammarly for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Isn't it... uh, 
thanks be to Grammarly for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Be- There's an apostrophe. It's T H A N K apostrophe S. <laughs> Grammarly is a communication tool that helps people improve their writing to be mistake free, clear, and effective. Start writing confidently by heading to grammarly.com forward slash SB, and you're going to get 20% off a Grammarly premium account today. And also thanks to Cabbage for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Get the money you need to run your small business today. Go to cabbage.com to get started. Credit lines subject to review and change. Individual requests for capital are separate installment loans issued by Celtic Bank, member FDIC. We've got a premium episode for you today. Chris Mamula coming down to the basement, but some disturbing, disturbing stuff about women and life insurance in our headlines. So let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. We'll talk about life insurance in just a moment, but a short headline to kick this off. Uh, This comes to us from Financial Planning. It's written by Sean Aloka. You see this headline, OG? Vanguard's robo-recommendations, Vanguard funds only. Vanguard's latest plan robo-advisor will feature bare-bones pricing and a low bar for entry, but it also will demand investors' exclusivity of its clients. The indexing giant's pilot Vanguard Digital Advisor will be priced at 15 basis points and have a $3,000 account minimum, but allocate clients' assets almost entirely in Vanguard funds. Clients will otherwise have to request to personalize their portfolios with outside funds. The platform's investment strategies founded in the same glide path and asset allocation, that's uh, OG's favorite phrase, that serves Vanguard's target retirement single mutual fund, according to SEC filings. The approach is also used in Vanguard's hybrid advice platform, Personal Advisor Services, where clients are paired with in-house CFPs that help set up financial plans and create investment strategies. Those CFPs are required to recommend only Vanguard products unless directed to do otherwise by clients in extenuating circumstances. This is something that most people don't know about. They have no idea that when you hire the Vanguard CFP right in front of them next to their computer, it says you must invest all in Vanguard products. Well, I mean, I don't know. Does that really bother you that much? No. I mean, Fidelity does the same thing. I was just working with a client that has had money at Fidelity and all their stuff. It wasn't even like the normal Fidelity stuff. It was their Fidelity, blah, blah, blah. We don't, we can't even transfer it stuff. I mean, it's not off the reservation that much, is it? No, I don't think so. I mean, what's funny is, is that people give Wells Fargo hell because they do the same thing, but it's Wells Fargo. So it's fun to beat up on them. And the Vanguard apologists are going to come out of the rafters emailing me about, well, Vanguard's different. Yeah. But it's it's nonprofit, Joe. That makes it better. What doesn't bother me about that is the fact that Vanguard funds, especially obviously the the passive stuff, some of the active stuff, really, really good funds. Yeah. Schwab does it, Fidelity does it. I think the important thing is what you talked about was that nobody understands that that's what it is. Yes. It doesn't you matter know. if it's Vanguard, Fidelity, Wells Fargo. Yeah. Oppenheimer, you're you're eating the home cooking. Yeah. It's like when you go to a small country school to watch a football game on Friday night in Texas. You're eating home cooking, which includes sometimes the officiating. <laughs> <laughs> where you can hear where you can hear the official say personal foul fifteen yards with a banjo playing in the background. Is that what exactly. you're, you're talking to? Yeah. But sometimes there's actually good cook in there too. Yeah, sure. Which is kind of like the same, the, the, the same idiom. I'm using it twice or the same metaphor, I guess. Sometimes home cooking's good and sometimes home cooking's not so good. But it's just important to recognize, you know, you, you get their stuff. The other thing that I find pretty interesting that you said in that article was uh, it's the exact same thing as the target date fund, right? It's the same recommendations. It's just they're going to say it's... They're going to strip it all apart. It's like, I don't want cable. I'll just take ESPN. They're like, cool, we've got that. It's this. And I heard, on, I might have talked about this on the show some time ago, you know, in 10 years from now, there's going to be a company that's going to come out and go, you know how you have all these different subscriptions? You got a subscription to Showtime, subscription to HBO, you got NBC, CBS, Fox. 
you know what? We're going to put we it can together. Put that all together <laughs> just for you. We'll bundle it. And then you will only pay one fee. It's amazing. And, and we'll throw in a whole bunch of extra channels that you might not ever watch, like a &E. But and we'll call. This, you know, it's just the same stuff, like stripped out or put together. Like you could just pick how you you can have any cheeseburger you want as long as you have a cheeseburger. It's fantastic. Our second headline comes to us from uh, Forbes. This is uh, disturbing. Written by Liz Frazier. Why women don't purchase enough life insurance and why they need more. Uh, according to a new study by online life insurance agency Haven Life, of course, Haven Life and <laughs> also sponsors this show. There's a major gender gap when it comes to life insurance and women. The study shows that while women and men equally believe that their death would have a substantial impact on their family, women are not purchasing life insurance as frequently as men, nor purchasing as much. In fact, 67% of women surveyed said they had life insurance compared to 79% of men. Of those that had an individual life insurance policy, the women had an average coverage amount of 231342 compared to men who had an average amount, listen to this discrepancy, of 423102 More specifically, key findings from the survey include the majority of women and men, 79-78% uh, respondents said their own death would have a substantial impact on their family's quality of life. Two, respondents who did not have life insurance were asked to provide a numeric value for what they would purchase. The average coverage amount provided from women respondents was 175423 while the average coverage amount from men respondents was 355348 The average income for all women respondents was 52484 compared to the average income for men respondents at 72482 So it says, why? Is this why do women value their life less than men do? Isn't that sad? I think all of those numbers are woefully inadequate. I mean, you're going to talk a little bit about financial independence here in a little bit with Chris and the whole idea of accumulating enough money so that your money makes money, right? And in that conversation, you may talk about the 4% rule. People use that 25 times your household expenses is your financial independence target, maybe kind of a rule of thumb. Well, if you listen to those numbers that you just rattled off, two hundred fifty thousand or four hundred fifty thousand dollars, even round up to say three hundred and five hundred to make math a little easier, those numbers are still woefully inadequate to sustain probably the average person's lifestyle. Yeah. Right. So you the three hundred thousand dollars at four percent, thousand bucks a month. You know, I mean, that's probably for most people barely the mortgage payment. Not going to do it. You know, it's definitely not the mortgage payment, food, gas, electric, water, car insurance. It's not that. And I'd submit to you that even 500000 isn't that number. Well, um, and I like how Liz breaks this down because she, she makes a strong argument here. Oh, gee, listen to this. She said maybe it's because the traditional rule of thumb for how much life insurance is needed is based on your current income, usually around 5 to 10x. With women still earning less than men overall, more likely to take on the role of child care, 83% of women respondents indicated they take on the role of child care versus 57% of men respondents. According to these calculations, women need less life insurance than men, but the value of our life and role in the family is so much more than income. Although one's life or death can't be measured by money, when it comes to purchasing life insurance, we're forced to put a number on it. So what exactly is life insurance for? Well, the primary purpose of life insurance is to replace a lost income when a provider of the family dies. So for this straightforward purpose, the old rule of thumb makes sense. Somebody earns 100000 a year, they should probably have 500 to a million life insurance, you say even more. The problem is there's so much more loss than just income when a parent or provider dies. If you look at a couple where the woman stays at home with the kids, according to this calculation, the wife doesn't need any life insurance because she doesn't have any income. But what about the value for the unpaid role she's responsible for? That's that's a huge part. You and I know the the breadwinner loses their spouse who is taking care of the kids at home. Now, all of a sudden, there's a bunch of new expenses that the family didn't have in the past. Well, and just kind of extrapolate that a little bit further. Maybe now the breadwinner doesn't want to be the breadwinner anymore. And now you've lost some of the support if that person decides to transition to be the stay-at-home parent but you lost some of the support and you've lost all of the income this is a conversation that i have you know with clients all the time is that i really can't see a scenario in which 
the life insurance amounts for a couple are different. And it's usually the men who will say, well, you know, if Nancy gets knocked off, I'll, I'll just keep working. And it's like, maybe, Mr. Tough Guy. But who's going to take care of your kids? Who's going to do the dishes and wash the clothes and do all the stuff that's happening behind the scenes so you can get up every day at 6 o'clock in the morning and go to work for 12 hours and come home and have food and have the kids taken care of? You know, so... That number needs to be the same, and it needs to be an order of magnitude of about 10 of what you're talking about. Yeah, Liz writes near the bottom of this piece, she says, while the exact amount of life insurance needed is impossible to answer, one thing is sure, we need to rethink how we value the roles in our family. I don't think it's about replacing income. It's about making sure the expenses are taken care of. Yeah, it's that. It's the getting over the macho-ness if you're on the, if you're on the man side of things and saying, you know— Agree with me that hopefully you've never had to deal with this. So you can't tell me how you're going to respond to it. Saying like, oh, well, you know, how'd your weekend go, Bill? Ah, pretty crappy. Wife died. Um, so got that. But uh, anyway, back here at work today, you know, yeah. it's a little foolhardy to say, it, you know. It totally is. And you and I have worked with people both that that went through this before. I can say with 100% certainty, I didn't know as your financial advisor how you were going to respond after the death of a loved one. You've handed out an insurance check or two, I imagine, in your career. I have. I can tell you the single thing that everybody says, is this all there is? Because they're kind of wrapping their head around it. Not not like, you know, oh, is this all there is? Not greedy, but like, hey, let me just, let me make sure that I understand correctly. This is it. I've never met anybody that said, this is way too much. I should give half away. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so... And it's so cheap. Just go get it. Go to Haven. We're going to talk about them in a little bit. But if you're in good, if you're in tolerable health, this doesn't have to be good health. You know, you're talking about pennies every single day. So. And I don't think it's much about where you buy it from as it is. No. D- d- it, as get it, it is. It is get do- it from work. Open enrollment's coming up here pretty soon. Check the box that says the maximum. Well, like get as much as you can. And to Liz's point, just think about, spend a little time thinking about your expenses that you would have if a loved one died. And I think this is interesting. You know, a lot of the time he and she would have something to say about their life insurance. It's not about you. It's about your spouse. That's still living. It's the other one. Yeah. Yeah, You're gone. Bubba. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff uh, by Liz here. We'll link to these in the show notes at at stackybenjamins.com. Life insurance awareness month this month. I just think every month should be life insurance awareness month, you know? (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Shouldn't like, June be life insurance awareness month, January. No, none of those months. So, just, just, just September. Just September. Only think about this in September. I kind of like That's that right. better though. I don't like thinking about life insurance. I, I actually like thinking about it once, get it taken care of and not think about it again until I need it. Yeah. And before we get to our takeaway here, OG, I think we need to talk about just running a business in general because managing inventory, covering payroll, doing a hundred other things before lunch Just an average day for anybody who's tried to start a business. If you're thinking about starting a business, these are the things that make you realize just how valuable your time is. Getting the money you need shouldn't take up all of it. That's why Cabbage created a simple modern way for businesses to access up to $250,000 of credit. Cabbage's application, it's all online, takes just minutes to complete, and then you get your decision. And if you know just how much you're juggling There's absolutely so, so much to juggle as a business owner and filling out applications that, you know, they're not going to read drives me crazy. It's what I like about a lot of these uh, tech companies out here, you know, companies like Cabbage, they're stealing business from the big banks who continue to go with these forms that are 20, 30 years old. It drives me, drives me crazy. I told the story about buying my car. For me, buying from a car dealer was fantastic. My $5,000 car. And they had me fill out a bunch of stuff. And I'm like, nobody's going to read this. Uh, I'm paying cash. It drove me crazy. Anyway, it's a whole different show. Uh, If your business qualifies, you can access the amount you need right away and withdraw more funds whenever you need extra capital. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and has provided over 200,000 small businesses with access to funding. 
if you have a business, you know how difficult that is. I think I mentioned recently, you know, they're not in the business anymore, but the founders of Soul Cycle. If you get to go back and listen to how I built this and how they built Soul Cycle and, and several other companies, like all they talk about, OG, is how they needed capital. They needed capital, they couldn't get it, needed it, couldn't get it, and uh, good credit, everything, still couldn't get it. Funding a small business knowing that you have the money to last another day, huge part of the process. And really, if you if you don't know where the funding's coming from, it's very difficult to make good decisions, uh, you know, long-term decisions. You're stuck in the short-term stuff. Get the money you need to run your small business today. Go to cabbage.com to get started. That's K-A-B-B-A-G-E.com. Credit line subject to review and change. Individual requests for capital are separate installment loans issued by Celtic or Celtic Bank, member FDIC. So to wrap this up, I think our takeaways are, remember when you call CFPs at a fun family, you're probably going to get the home cooking. I think that's a, that's a good. Which could be sweet taste and barbecue or really crappy officiating. It could be, could be really good or really bad. And then uh, life insurance, have that conversation, get it taken care of and think about the expenses, not just about the income stream coming in. Chris Mamula, upstairs talking to mom right now. This guy retired at age 41 and using some traditional retirement planning techniques, but really mostly OG, re-examining his life and what he wanted out of life was a big part of his success. He's the co-author of the book, Choose FI. Let's say hello to our good friend, Chris Mamula. And coming down the stairs to the basement right now, it's our friend, Chris Mamula. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Mom just made me pumpkin pancakes. I How can I not be happy? I, I, I always wonder why all my guests always get the pancakes, the muffins, the brownies. I get none of that. J- just so you know, I get none of that stuff. I didn't know that. I, I uh, Sorry, I uh, opened an old wound. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yes. I'll have to talk. The good news is, and Doug already knows this, we get seconds though. You know what I mean? Hopefully you left us some, Chris. That's what we're hoping for. I want to talk about your story. A lot of the concepts in your amazing book are kind of encompassed in your story. So you started off in physical therapy. When did you decide you wanted to go into physical therapy? So I was a high school athlete and just had some injuries. And so that exposed me to that field. So I kind of always knew I wanted to get on that path. I really thought I wanted to do like sports medicine and work with professional sports teams or division one or something like that. And I went to the university of Pittsburgh. And so I worked with their football and basketball. And I quickly realized I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. Like all the travel and just the schedule that goes with that. It's not nearly as glamorous as I envisioned before I did it. So I kind of went down the physical therapy path where you have a little more normal life and a little more stability. Gotcha. But during your college career, you kind of got the negative piece, right? Which you didn't want to be, but did you ever get a chance to go out and do, because my brother-in-law is a physical therapist. Did you ever get a chance to go out and work with some of those people to see what that was all about? Yeah. I mean, you, so, I mean, like I said, I started on the patient side of it and then you had to do some volunteering and then throughout school you're doing internships. So it's a rewarding profession and the respect that you get to help people on a daily basis. And I did orthopedic, so almost everybody gets better. So that's helpful that to keep things positive, but it just gets very repetitive. And once I got into our healthcare system, um, it didn't take me very long to know that I didn't want to be doing that for 40 years. So I didn't know how to, I didn't know what the path out of that was, but I knew I didn't want to be doing it for the next 40 years. Well, and that's my big question is that there's a lot of disillusionment that you had early on. Was it disillusionment first with the career and then the lifestyle that you built around that career? Or did it start off with the disillusionment about the lifestyle and then the career is a piece of that? I would say more with the career because my lifestyle, I mean, so we kind of were on the path to fire, if you will, very early on, but we didn't know that we that was even possible. Um, but we were just good savers. My wife and I, neither of us came from uh, backgrounds with much money. And so when we got out of school, my wife had a little bit of debt and I wanted to be debt free before we got married. So we kind of started living off her salary and using mine to get her out of debt and it was working fine. So we just kind of stayed on that path. So really from day one, 
we lived off her salary and saved mine. So in rough terms, we were saving like 50% from day one, which is now looking back, I don't even know where we really got the insight to do that, but it was pretty remarkable. And we were living pretty comfortably because we were both growing our income. So we were inflating our lifestyle. So we never really felt sacrifice or actually the last time I was in Detroit, um, it was for Super Bowl 40. We came up when the Steelers were in it <laughs> and uh, went to the Super Bowl. So, I mean, we did all kinds of things like that. We traveled internationally. We did the things we really wanted to do. We just saved on the big things, housing, cars, food that everybody in the, the fire community talks about now. But, but at that time, th- th- there was no community. I mean, you were no, just- No, we just kind just... of intuitively figured it out. Um, yeah. 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 That's really cool. I want to ask about that because I also came from a family that didn't have a lot of money, but my path was, Hey man, let's go spend cash. Like it's, you know, I remember I got my first credit card. I thought it was so cool that somebody would let me spend somebody else's money. That was awesome. Like, what do you think it was that was the trigger for you to want to stay away from debt from the very beginning? For me, it was just being beaten into me by my parents from (laughs) forever. Like we didn't come from much and, and my parents weren't sophisticated financially, but they did uh, have that part locked down. And my mom particularly was very just frugal. And and if you can't pay for it in cash, you can't afford it is kind of the way I was raised. So I had that just kind of ingrained in me. And then for my wife, it really came from a very different place. Like her family, uh, probably income wise, we were on the similar upbringing, but her family just didn't have that sense with money. And she kind of went through some hard times and it scarred her. So for her, I think saving was more security. So Uh, We came at it from different angles, but we were really on the same page from day one that, you know, we didn't need to spend a lot to be happy. And so we didn't. But you retired, retired. You didn't really retire. I mean, you were financially dependent at 41, dropped the career, didn't love at 41. But it sounds like that wasn't always the goal. Like what was the goal at first when you're, you're saving half your income? What's the goal just to be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want? I don't really know that there was a goal because I, I just didn't think, I mean, to me, early retirement for a normal couple with normal jobs meant 55 or 60, maybe like normal people don't retire at 30 or 40. And investing was like just super out of our, even the realm that I could possibly do that. And so we never really learned about it. So all the technical side, there really was no plan. Um, Just kind of intuitively, we tried to get our house paid off quickly because we figured if we got our expenses down, we just didn't need to make as much. So that was one of the first things we did is we paid off our, our mortgage in about seven years. And we were just kind of going through and we really kind of got into an outdoorsy lifestyle and wanted to do more of that stuff. And so we were actually looking to move west. It was probably 2012. And we were just going to kind of be ski bums and make enough to get by. And we kind of had built up a nest egg by that point. And we didn't think we could have kids. And then we found out my wife was pregnant. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, that was a shocker. Yeah, that's and cool. So then I, we had another life to be responsible for. So I realized, you know, I probably need to get serious <laughs> about this and figure out what the heck I'm actually doing. So that was my impetus to get serious. That's interesting how having another life in your family, having a young life in your family, like it starts to make you get more concrete about your goals. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people think you can't retire early with kids. For us, it was the absolute opposite. Like we would have probably still been drifting and, and who knows if I would have quit working without knowing what the heck I was doing and uh, who knows where that would have taken us. So yeah, it was definitely a blessing in many ways, but financially is one I don't think many people think of, but yeah, for us having a kid was a financial blessing too. Well, and it's funny, you make a really good point that in the words choose FI, choose financial independence, everybody focuses on the financial independence, but really the more important word there that you guys did at that point was choose. Like choose is this huge word that I think everybody kind of breezes past. Yeah. We were making choices early on. We didn't really know why or what direction we were going or what was even possible, but we always kind of knew we wanted something different. And I mean, it's kind of that saying like the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. So even though we didn't know what we were doing and we were slowly growing and learning, um, we were making choices and we were just constantly getting a little bit better each time. And and that's a thing we emphasize in the book is just that incremental improvement and uh, growing and learning. I want to dive into that a little bit. You make this point. You say that you started life heading down the standard path like most people do. Describe the standard path for me, if you don't mind. So I went to public schools and my wife went to a Catholic school and in both environments, like, you know, you're taught, you go to college and like, that's the key. You go to college, you get a good job and then you get out and like, that's the path and you make money. And then the good life is you buy the house. And that was the first thing we did is we went out and bought a house with a 30 year mortgage and you get two cars. And we were pretty fortunate there that we figured that out from the beginning. We didn't finance our cars, but we were a two car family and just kind of our whole life revolved around going to work, 
driving, you know, beating up our cars, spending money on gas, like commuting to and from work, spending all this time at work to then come home and take care of our house. And we just didn't really have time for the stuff we actually wanted to do. But it was like the quote unquote American dream. And so we realized pretty early we had to start making changes and and we did. I mean, we uprooted, we we moved back to our hometown where I could make more and our cost of living was less. Um, we just did things differently with our housing. We did a lot of things differently um, and we started making those choices. But up until that point where I was probably in my early mid twenties, yeah, we were definitely going down that standard path that most people go down. Yeah. Because you say you, you, you make a, a couple of really great points. You have this really nice car that you don't really get to love because of the fact that the only place you're driving it to is this job that you don't really like. And then the house, you're so exhausted after work, you just kind of plop down there instead of really enjoying the house. Like it's this, well, you use the word hamster wheel. I think that's appropriate. Yeah. And I think it's hard for most people to get off and just at the risk of kind of sounding like arrogant or something, but I don't really know where we got the insight to make the change because most people go down that and there was no fire movement down there. So there was no role models for us. So on one hand, I kind of kicked myself for some of the stuff I wish I would have known now because some of the mistakes we made. But on the other hand, we definitely had a lot of insight to just start making changes. I don't really know, I guess, on blind faith that there was something better for us if we started doing things differently. So. That's what I was thinking. You talk a fair amount about kind of kicking yourself and feeling frustrated with mistakes that you've made. But even as I was reading that, Chris, I was like, but this is your education. You know what I mean? Seriously, you're making mistakes with relatively small at the time amounts. So don't get me wrong. At that time, it's all the money you have, but mm -hmm. small amounts of money then so that now that you have your plan, you can avoid all those problems. Yeah. And so we quickly rectified like the, like spending too much on, on our house and having the long commutes and all that kind of stuff. But then as, so as we started to build our savings rate, we just kind of thought you can't be a do it yourself investor. And that was kind of way over our head. And so we went and we sought out an advisor, but we didn't know what, I mean, there's so many different types of advisors and so many different models and we just didn't know what questions to ask. So we really didn't ask any, unfortunately. And so then we made more mistakes on that front where uh, we were just, doing pretty much everything you could do wrong as far as tax planning and investing, we were doing wrong, but we didn't know. And so, yeah, that took a while for us to figure that out. I want to dive into that in just a moment, but before we get there, I want to stick with this point just a little longer, which is, it sounds like though, there was kind of this flip. When you looked at the house, you looked at the car, you realized that the job you're in, you can make more money, live cheaper in your mid twenties. Like, do you remember that moment? Do you remember where you were? Do you remember the conversation you had? Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I remember sitting with my wife in our living room, like on a Saturday morning. And so we had two cars. She was driving like probably 10 minutes to a park and ride to get on a bus and ride 35, 40 minutes into the city where she worked. I was driving 45 minutes, the opposite direction. Uh, we were both early in our career. So we we're probably working nine, 10 hour days. Most Saturdays I worked in the mornings also. And it was just like that hamster wheel where we were just, just going to keep pace just to then come home. And like, we bought this house because we were kind of enamored. It had an in-ground pool and our pool was like constantly overtaken with algae because like we never had time to actually get in and like <laughs> agitate it and move stuff around. So we'd shock it on the weekend and then we'd just get the chemicals where we can get in and then we'd go back to work. And it was just this cycle and it just, frankly, it just sucked. Like it was not what we thought we were getting into when we worked so hard to go through school and get these jobs and everything. And like I said, we knew we wanted something different pretty early. I was talking to a neighbor of mine yesterday who got rid of his pool partly for that reason. He's like, it's a ton of upkeep. I don't use it. I'd rather use a neighbor's pool. You know? Yes. <laughs> neighbor's pool, community pool. Those are all great. Having your own pool, it's not, not good. So much better. I want to talk about your early influences because the fire community wasn't there yet. You initially said that you started off reading books and articles and you heard the man on the radio, Mr. Dave Ramsey, who really didn't speak to you, you said, but he was all that was available. Do you remember what books you were reading with, uh, early on, what articles you were reading? You know, that's a good question. I really don't. It was just kind of very random, anything I would come across. Like Dave Ramsey, I would listen to because I, so I was a physical therapist and then we did outreach with high schools. So I would drive to cover high school football practices. And so just 10, 15 minutes in my car every day, that just happened to be on the talk radio. And so I would listen to him. And, uh, and so I do remember listening to Dave Ramsey, but as far as anything else, I honestly don't remember. It was just kind of more just random things I would come across. And, and it's really hard to even know where to start with when you're trying to educate yourself with personal finance stuff. Well, and that's what I thought was really cool was that you're reaching out all these different places and you're hitting these walls, but you're kind of defining where you're headed at that point. You typed in extreme early retirement 
and you came across Jacob Lund Fisker. And I have to say, when I read that, I laughed out loud. I did, you know, everybody says the LOL. I did. I'm, I'm reading the intro and I laughed because what's cool is you kind of went where I thought you were going to go with this. But you had another aha, like looking at his stuff, which is very cool. That wasn't for you either. By that point, I was really getting burnt out on my career. So I kind of thought maybe this was for me, even though it, like, it sounded kind of crazy and kind of extreme. I thought maybe this is for me, but then we should actually, I went to my... We should actually have you tell people exactly what what kind of stuff Jacob talks about first, I so guess. So like, uh, like one of the things that stood out to me is he talked about like going to say like a Costco or a Sam's Club or something and you buy like beans and rice and like these 10 pound bags to get it as economically feasible as possible and get everything as low as possible. So I think he was living in the San Francisco Bay Area and he described living on like less than $10,000 a year and like living in a trailer. And But I was like, you know, I just wanted out of like the life I was living. So I still wanted to do something different. So I went to my wife with this and I quickly realized that was not for us. Like she, <laughs> she uh, clarified for me that no, that was not happening. But there were several, which first was that, that you didn't have to be, you really didn't have to be. And you make this point all over, you know, everything from the pillars of FI uh, throughout your book. None of this has to be extreme, Chris. No. And honestly, that's why I started writing. It's, it's kind of amusing. Like I know this is audio and people can't see me, but I am a white dude. Uh, but I started writing just to kind of add some diversity to the mix because at that time it was, it was all like these tech kind of engineer people. Everything was about like extreme frugality and we were getting the big things right with housing, cars, food. So we had this high savings rate and we were still able to live. And like, we were traveling the world, doing the stuff, going to Super Bowls, doing stuff like that. And like, I just didn't really relate to that aspect and I wanted to add some diversity. So I was from the medical field, which there was really nobody writing about fire from that when I started, at least not that I had found. Um, and so I just wanted to give a different perspective and that's what kind of motivated me to get started going down this road and writing about it. You had a horrible experience with financial advisors. Your parents have had horrible experiences with financial advisors. Tell me about that. My parents never really made a lot of money. But because my mom was so frugal and such a good planner, uh, she was able to help us with school and they were kind of doing, we thought, okay. And so we thought this advisor must really know what he's doing. He's getting them to this point. And kind of what we learned looking back is I think they got there despite the advice they got. So we didn't know what questions to ask or where to go. So we thought my parents were doing pretty good. So we just said, who is your advisor? And that was the amount of research we did. And then we went in and that became our advisor. And then we, we basically just followed whatever he asked us to do. Uh, we really, again, we didn't know what questions even to ask. So we didn't ask any questions. What were some of those bad things you ended up doing? I, I think the simplest thing most people should probably be doing is investing with their 401k, especially a higher earner. So you get the, you can use the tax deferral. So my, my boss signed me up to put in enough that I would get the company match. And he didn't talk me out of that, but he explicitly told us we shouldn't invest more because he had better options and he could he could do so much more for us than if we were limited to the choices in a 401k. So you said and my wife, wait a minute, hold on. You, you accidentally said my boss. Yeah, no, my boss, he put us into the, like he automatically enrolled us in the 401k. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, but then you switched over then I see. And, and, and the advisor didn't talk you out of that. So he didn't talk us out of doing that, but he talked us out of investing any more. Any with more. The, like, so other than that minimum yeah. amount that we would get the employer. Match. Cause he wanted you to invest more with him. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. It probably yeah. into some commission-based mutual fund. Exactly what it was. Yep. And yes. uh, we were doing that. And as we started to accumulate more assets, so everything's in actively managed funds in taxable accounts. So then those start churning off and producing more income. So now we got to the point we couldn't even contribute to our Roth because it was pushing our income up, uh, which we could have easily, uh, once we took control, we were able to easily. So we had that opportunity cost. Probably the biggest kicker was when my wife rolled over her 403B and he had us put it into a variable annuity inside of a retirement account, which is, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, it was bad. Like pretty much everything we should not do, we did. Mm. Um, so, and looking back, it's really obvious now, but again, like I didn't even know we owned a variable annuity or what that was. So you do make one point in the book. Well, well actually, so you ended up helping your parents uh, fire their advisor. Well, I just basically, so I talked to them. I told them kind of what I was learning. And actually it was kind of almost created a little bit of tension between us. I think a lot of people I see this with now, um, they felt like they had this relationship with the advisor and, you know, did I even know what I was talking about? So it actually, they didn't come and we didn't do this right away, um, but they started reading my blog and, and following what some of the stuff that I was talking about. And it probably took two or three years. And they finally said, you know, we'd like you to sit down with us and 
show us what we're paying, show us what kind of advice we're getting. And it took a while for them to come around. And then they said, you know, we would like you to help us. Like they didn't want to learn it at that point in their life. And so I helped them now with their finances, but yeah, with their investments at least. Uh, but yeah, it took a while. It wasn't an immediate thing by any means. And I've seen you do other interviews where you've said that your parents shouldn't have had an advisor. Well, I mean, to be fair, things were very different when they started. I mean, there wasn't, you couldn't go online and buy Vanguard index funds and it was a different time. So the industry is changing. They did the best they could with the knowledge they had. I wish we would have asked more questions instead of just assuming that what they were doing was the right thing, but the past is the past. Yeah. Because as I read that, I thought, and as I heard that, I thought, well, you're their financial advisor. I mean, you are, you're a much better advisor. You're a disinterested. I mean, you're kind of interested, but you're a disinterested third party. You're not sitting there in their goals. I think having good advisors in your corner is like a, is a, is a fantastic thing, but it is, it's about having people that are truly good advisors out there instead of, I mean, it sounds like you found a commission salesperson stock jock kind of. Yeah, for sure. And like when I started writing, I was very dogmatic that like everybody should be a do it yourselfer. And yes. And what I, as, as you start talking to people, like talking to my parents, talking to readers that write in and you realize, man, like people need help. And so I've come around to like when I write, I want to educate people. So if they have the inclination, um, they can do it themselves. But definitely, I don't think that everybody should be or even can. And so I'm also think that we have to help people find the right people that are actually looking out to help them and are in serving their best interests rather than looking yeah. out for themselves. Yeah. Teach people like you guys do in the book, teach people which questions to ask. And I think the other big point here is, is that like, it's always your goal, like delegating that to anybody. Like, don't get me wrong, hire somebody to educate you, but not somebody to take it and run with it. I don't think anybody should do that. That just drives me crazy. But anyway, I want to ask you about that. You guys, you and your spouse, what I love about this, you guys have a very personalized financial plan. So you start off down the traditional path. You veered into your own path. You hit a lot of walls along the way, but you still got there at flipping 41, which is even though you feel like you could have gone faster. So no, no shame in that game. You now have a financial plan that is personalized and it's yours and it doesn't really include rules of thumb. So my question to you is, was that easy? <laughs> Not at all. So we went from kind of just thinking early retirement just isn't really realistic for people like us. And then we started reading these fire blogs and it sounded so simple. It's like, oh, well, you just figure out what you spend, save 25 times that based on this 4% rule, meaning you can withdraw 4% of your money and, and go in forever and your money won't run out. And it sounds so simple. But to get to that point, by the time you're 40, you have to kind of feel comfortable and like saving because if you're suffering and sacrificing, you're not going to probably stick with that to reach the point of financial independence. And so now if you're going from having this abundance mindset and you're saving and and now all of a sudden you're spending down your assets, it's scary as heck. And yeah, I mean, we weren't at all excited about that as we started to get close and it started to create a lot of tension. And I mean, we would just start fighting about stupid stuff. Like we never fought about money. And now we're like arguing about money, like how much should be on our savings and what should we do with this and that. And we realized like, this is not the path we want to be going down. And retirement, I think was the wrong goal all along. So what we kind of came back to is what we've always, always been doing anyway, is using the bit of financial independence we had to create better conditions where we could do whatever we want. Uh, and so that's kind of where we're at now. Like, so my wife still works part time and I'm writing and we have a ton of flexibility in our life, but we also kind of still have that abundance and, and we don't feel that scarcity. And a lot of these things that scare people, um, like I write now at the site, can I retire yet? Where we talk about a lot about the retirement decision and you get this, these people, they, they get to that 25 times and they get to 30 times. It's just, it's hard to pull the trigger if yeah. you're, if it's an all or nothing thing, but it doesn't have to be. And, and again, that's just one of those things, just learning to think differently. I don't want to let that go either, Chris, because you kind of said this very quickly. You said retirement was probably the wrong goal. And I think that's the case for a ton of people. And based on the intro to your new book, Choose FI, you believe that too. People will criticize like people in the fire movement, like you're not really retired. But where I started getting this idea was from AARP, which I think they know a little bit about retirement. <laughs> uh, and they talk about Encore Careers and they have this Life Reimagined program. And I was like, well, if they're talking about that with even people in their 60s and 70s, why do I want to retire when I'm 40? And why am I trapping myself into that? And again, it's just learning to ask better questions and grow as, as and figure stuff out as you go. So that's something that was very important to me. And I wanted to emphasize that in the book for other people. 
The book is called Choose FI, uh, Your Blueprint to Financial Independence. You write it with these two jokers, uh, Brad and Jonathan. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> of course, they've both been on the show and we love those guys. Where, where does everybody get the book? It's available tomorrow uh, at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or wherever you find your books. Yeah, nice work. And I would be remiss if while we have you here in the basement, you mentioned Can I Retire Yet? Darrow is one of my favorite people. He's been on the show a couple times. How did the two of you meet up and start working together? Because talk about two great minds that go great together. I thought that's that, that's like a marriage made in heaven. Yeah, so we talked about I started writing my original blog probably five years earlier. And I was just writing, a lot of it was to kind of keep myself accountable and to learn as I went. And so I never really grew my audience, but I, I really knew I liked writing. And so I was a reader of Can I Retire Yet? And, and I was a big fan of Darrow's work. I just read one of his posts and I kind of sensed he was burning out a little bit. And, and he had never even had a guest post on the blog after five years himself writing. And so I just reached out and I said, you know, I kind of get this sense that you're getting tired of this. Would you think maybe having some fresh blood would rejuvenate you? Would you be interested in a partner in any way? And I didn't even know if I would get any response. And like within 24 hours, I got, uh, I would actually be very open to that conversation. And we just started talking from there. And, and so kind of, I think our original plan was I was going to buy out the blog over time through like a sweat equity deal. And he's kind of gotten rejuvenated over the last year or two with having me on board. And so we're actually going to partner and he's going to stay on hopefully for the long term until one of us gets tired of it. So we'll be <laughs> partners with him. Well, I love that because as much as we love your writing, we love his too. And you two together back and forth, it's fantastic stuff. Chris, thanks for hanging out with us and talking about choosing financial independence for a few minutes. Uh, it's been a pleasure and I'm going to run up and talk to your mom, see if I can get a little bit of coffee. I'm so jealous. <laughs> it's good stuff. <laughs> Hey there, money lovers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to the cream de la cream of this here podcast, My Trivia. You know, if, you're a, if you're a TV show guru, today's question just might be in your wheelhouse, but we're not talking about any of those brand new hits like Friends and Everybody Loves Raymond or Seinfeld or even Magnum P.I. You see, our trivia today it's going all the way back to a different era known as the 1960s. How about this question right here? Before The Simpsons came and took the crown as the most successful animated show, what show had uh, previously held the title as the most financially successful and longest-running animated franchise on your TV? I'll have your answer right after this. Well, if you've listened to this show for any length of time, you know how much we love Grammarly. Now that we've changed the show around a little bit, we have producers for each show. Caden Thompson takes care of this Friday show. Taylor Eichenberg takes care of Wednesday. And Richie rudder takes care of the Monday podcast. We're always passing notes back and forth, and we all use Grammarly. Thanks to Grammarly for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Grammarly is a communication tool that helps people improve their writing to be mistake-free, clear, and effective. They encourage everybody, even the best students, top professionals, podcast producers, to use Grammarly to do their best work and accomplish even more of their goal. If you're not sure what Grammarly is, well, it's a writing assistant that makes you look and sound a lot smarter you can polish up everything and easily improve yourself and your communication at school, work, almost anywhere with Grammarly. They help people show off their best self through their writing, and they're available across platforms, including online browser extensions, desktop editors, mobile keyboard checker. You can find it on just about any browser, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, any of the, the – is there another browser beyond that? I don't think so. Uh, maybe. And platforms, iOS, Android, Windows, Mac – their free product reviews, critical spelling and grammar, but their premium, which is what I use, looks out for spelling, grammar, plus advanced punctuation, structure, style within context, vocabulary suggestions, conciseness, and readability for different occasions. So whether it's a business proposal, script for a podcast, academic essay, casual blog post, whatever, you will look and sound much better. Accomplish your goals well from Grammarly. Stop making those email typos when you're on the phone. Close more deals at work with your emails. Polish your resume to get the job done. I'm somebody that uses a lot of words, and my producers really like it because they're able to structure sentences much better for Doug and OG and I. 
Head to Grammarly.com forward slash SB, and here's what you're going to get. 20% off your Grammarly premium account today. That's Grammarly.com forward slash SB for 20% off your Grammarly premium account. Welcome back there, cartoon lovers. I'm your Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And apparently, according to these yahoos, there are shows more modern than everybody loves Raymond. (laughs) Right? Blasphemy, I say. Well, throw out those new shows. Break out the bell bottoms. Pull on a tie-dye shirt and cue up a yellow submarine record because, uh, you know, we're going all the way back to the 60s. What? Joe, I think we got a script problem over here. I need some attendance stat. This uh, this seems like stuff we already do here. Uh, okay, fine. I'll, I'll read it. Well, you know, just like uh, all those things, here's one thing that never goes out of style. My trivia, I'll tell you that. Earlier, I asked you this question before The Simpsons came around. Which animated show was the most financially successful and longest-running animated show on TV. And uh, if you said The Flintstones, you'd be correct. The cartoon, which originally released in 1960, was the first animated series to hold a primetime slot. Unbelievably, because animation, I mean, like, who doesn't like animation? They should have been doing this from the get-go. Uh, you know, the, the Flintstones held on to its title as best animated show until those silly Simpsons came along in, uh, in, in 89. So, but you you can figure out the rest of it. Peace and chicken grease, cheese bags. See ya. Yabba dabba do. You got it. Can't stump me, baby. That's that's pretty good, man. That's nice. I did not get that one. I thought it was Bugs Bunny. It's fairly certain it's going to be Bugs Bunny. Yeah, that I, I bet you in total. Looney Tunes or the Mel, what's his name? You know, that whole Mel thing, Blank, that yeah. enterprise probably made more money than Flintstones. But I think Flintstones was more of a, by like, you know, yeah, by every, itself. every day, you know, you got home and there's Flintstones is on. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first, your loved ones and your time by making buying quality term life insurance actually simple. And because, OG, it's online and it's very quick, my question to you is this. What would you do with all that time you save not going through the life insurance application process? Mm, Definitely eating brontosaurus burgers and sliding down the back of the dinosaur tail. (laughs) Is that a euphemism? (laughs) I got got no idea what what that would be a euphemism for, but... Uh, if you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now, you'll get a free quote. Prices are affordable and they're issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, which is more than 160. And today we're throwing out the lifeline to Steven. Say hi, Steven. What's up, Joel and OBGYN? Recently you got a question and you said that that was the new bar. Well, buckle up because I'm about to raise that bar. So a little bit of background about me first. I'm a college student in my early 20s living in Southern California in my mom's garage because we don't have those weird basement things out here. Anyways, I'm a waiter making a decent enough income, but it puts me into a lower tax bracket, about 12%, I believe. So my question is this. I'm ready to start a retirement account. I've been doing some research online, and it seems like a Roth IRA is a better fit for me right now because I'd rather pay the taxes on it first and get those over with. Online, it seems to be saying that one of the main benefits to a traditional IRA is that it will give you a tax deduction. But since I'm so young and in such a low tax bracket already, a tax deduction doesn't seem like too much of a draw to me. Am I missing something? I feel like things this obvious and straightforward always have some sort of catch. Well, I'm not expecting to learn anything from you guys. So if you can pass this question on to Doug, that'd be great. Oh, and I almost forgot one last thing. I have a ton of money in a target date fund that is charging me 1.4% annually. (laughs) Because the next recession is coming in 11 days, I'm thinking that I'm going to take all my money out of that and put it into an inverse market ETF that only charges (laughs) 1.39%. Smart move, right? I know. It's a great idea, so I just kind of wanted to show off to the other listener. Oh, and by the way, tell Gertrude I'm a 12XL. Thanks. 12XL. (laughs) Steven... Fairly large personality, I would say, Mister Twelve XL. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Everybody's a comedian with their little 
expense ratio jokes and target date fun. So awesome. So awesome. So funny. Let let that one go across the plate. There's, you know, I I mean, when it comes to the actual question, which is the Roth thing, I agree with that 100%. You're in a low tax bracket. Pay taxes now. Put all the money in the Roth. Never pay taxes again for as long as you live. I mean, it's not that overly complicated. There's the only asterisk is this. If Congress changes their mind, or if they change their mind and retroactively change their mind, which I've not know them known them to do except kind of once with the whole oil and gas Tafra thing stuff back in uh, late eighties, eighties. But nevertheless, I mean, I think um, I think that's the right way to do it. Uh, I wouldn't overthink it. I actually think that most people screw things up by trying to overthink it. You know, there there, there isn't a correct answer. Just like we were talking about on the life insurance saying, well, what's the right number? Is it a million? Is it 1.5 million? Is it 2.3? Probably no right answer. But I can tell you the right answer is not 300,000. You know, so should he put money in the traditional IRA or the Roth or the 401k pre or post tax? Yeah, probably the after tax stuff, probably get it in the Roth. But the right answer is, is not to do nothing. You know, I mean, he has to do, he has to uh, save money. So he's trying to, trying to optimize that. And that's great. So, well, and that would be, that would be my choice too, because when you do the pre-tax, you're trying to maximize the tax bracket situation and take the bird in the hand right now. And frankly, the bird in the hand ain't that big, like he said, you know, so, so pay a little bit of tax and, and cross your fingers that you'll never have to pay that tax again. Probably won't. So, now, there is a bigger thing to think about here, too, Stephen, which is also if this is your first money into a Roth, I like putting that in right away because that money has to sit there five years when you first put it in. So establishing that mark ASAP to get a Roth open so that now you've got that five year window started as soon as possible. I think that's also better for liquidity reasons, OG. Yeah, for the withdrawal purposes. So that's a lesson for everybody, right? Fifty dollars, you know, in a Roth IRA at age sixteen, perfect. Starts the five years, and and it's not five years on every dollar; it's five years from the accounts open. So start it as early as possible. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks for the question, Stephen. You got a question for us? You want to bring it like Stephen did, Mister OBGYN? Head to stackybenjamins.com. Damn it, I've been found out. <laughs> stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And uh, you too can tell Gertrude what size shirt you want, even though she doesn't care. I think everybody's on to the fact that she doesn't care. They just want to brag about being a 12XL, which is only three sizes smaller than OG. So good for Steven. That's going to do it for today. Two quick things. Thanks to everybody who's left us a review of this here show, wherever you listen. That tells people what they're getting into when they listen to the Stacky Benjamin Show. And mom always loves putting those on the fridge. And then last is this. It's closing in on the end of the year. And if you're putting your team together for 2020 and you want to have it in place, OG and his team are taking new clients To interface with them, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG, and uh, that will get you rolling on setting up your team so you go into the new year ready to roll. All right, that's going to do it today. Doug, you've got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, if these listeners have half a brain cell left, like I almost did after my time at Southwest Bahama State Technical School and Beauty Institute, I bet you they've already figured it out. But all right, sure, I'll piece it together for you. First, take some advice from Chris. While you don't need to stop dreaming about your big goals, you do need to sit down and make a personalized plan on how you're actually going to get there. The time is definitely worth the effort. Uh, Second, take some advice from our headlines. No one wants to think about their own mortality, but one of the best things you can do for your family is making sure they'll be taken care of after you're gone. But the big takeaway, don't use the term old people show around Joe's mom. Apparently, they're uh, refined shows meant for a better time. Yeah, you show me one 70s action show that tops two hours of Michael Bay explosions, and then we can talk, sister. 
special thanks to Chris Mamula. You can order Chris's new book, Choose FI, at CanIRetireYet.com or through our show notes at StackingBenjamins.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I do not like computer jokes. Not one bit. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. I've been to see a couple movies. We talked about trips last week. This week, I want to dive into movies before we get too far behind. I saw this film uh, a couple weeks ago. This is called Peanut Butter Falcon. There's sheep in this world, and there are wolves in this world. And I know that you two boys are just two weary travelers who lost their way. So, we're going to clean you up right. With a baptism. I'm more of a baptism by fire type. Okay. Come to my wrestling school and become a badass. That's what he wants to do with the rest of his life. Yes, it is. You let a half-naked boy with Down syndrome who has no idea how to get along in this world just slip out from under your nose. You two are close. We are. Well, then you'll figure out where he's at and you'll bring him back. Maybe we could be friends and buddies, bro dogs, and chill. Have a good time. You seen the wrestling schools in Aiden? Yeah. So this is the story of, as you heard in that clip, a story of a young man with Down syndrome played by actor Zach Gottsagen. And uh, he escapes this home where Bruce Dern is his roommate, of course, the same Bruce Dern who was in Nebraska. Bruce Dern's been in so many movies. And uh, the whole thing, OG, of him escaping this home where most everybody else is a senior citizen with nowhere else to go is hilarious. Well, he hooks up with a young man with a troubled past, believe it or not, played by Shia LaBeouf. Is it Shia LaBeouf? Shia? Shia? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's your favorite actor. Well, it's funny. I can't. I really do not. I do. I do not like him. I've liked him in one role. And, Transformers, uh, obviously. Transformers. That first Transformers. One, two, and three. Oh, t- t- everything past one sucked. Transformers one, I thought was really, really good. But the rest of them, I I didn't really like. But I liked him in that. And uh, Dakota Johnson is the woman who is uh, from this facility that's chasing him and so this is a movie that after a while you you figure out that it kind of is a play on the old story of huck finn and this journey and meeting all these characters and a story about redemption and growing up this movie and i can't believe i'm about to say this about shia labeouf cheryl and i got done with this og and the very first thing out of our mouths was, that's it. That's the best movie we've seen this year. Easily the best movie we've seen this year. It's 
trying to take him to see a wrestling school, the flaws of all the characters, the hilarity uh, between the two of them, uh, the acting, the the stakes. Peter Butter Falcon was just a fantastic movie. I can't believe I hadn't heard of it. Of course, right after we saw it, I see it all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, but but this was a really, really good movie that I don't care who you are. You know how you have friends over and you don't know what movie to watch or you decide you're you're going to watch a movie with a group of people. This is a movie that I I think I defy nearly anyone to say they don't like this film. This this is a really truly special film and um loved it thought it was thought it was fantastic and i can't believe i'm saying that about uh sheila booth transformers more than me ci <laughs> did he call bumblebee while he was there he he did not there were a couple scenes where he, he needed bumblebee too <laughs> yeah and bumblebee didn't uh bumblebee didn't make it uh thomas hayden church is in this and whenever i see that guy resurrected did you ever watch wings no no is that before no, you? Two, yeah, it's just a little before my time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wings was so good. So whenever I see Thomas Hayden Church, you know what I'm talking about, though. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Probably <laughs> not, but whatever. Such a good actor. Uh, go see this movie. Go see Peanut Butter Falcon.